All right, this is the Book of Israel certification course, and we're going to be in today, chapter 2. Chapter 2, the clock will start ticking off the last three and a half years called the end, number one. The Catholic Church is active in the actions of the U.S., Israel, and Europe. This was given, this sermon was given back in the fourth Roman month of the of 2003 and it's really amazing the information that the timeliness of how this class and this study of this subject is coming about with the ticking off of this last three and a half years that has just recently started you know you, that just goes to show that Yahweh is in complete control and that there are things that that Yahweh wants us to know that we need to know and this is stuff that pastor's been telling us all along. We've been, we've been taught these things all along. And this is proof positive of that. And as we go forth in this chapter throughout the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, the main subject, the main subject here of this. We're looking here, the main subject here is the seven-year peace plan the Catholic Church, the Ten Kings, and the Quartet in Prophecy. So this is the things that we're going to be looking for. This is, this is the, the subject that Pastor is, is, is covering. And there's actually, within the lesson plan, there's actually little subsections in here that we'll get to, and we're going to cover a few of those, a few of those in class this evening. Now, the scriptures that we're going to be looking to reinforce, there's, there's two scriptures that are, going to be re, that are going to be reviewed consistently throughout this class, throughout this chapter. And that is going to, first one here is going to be in Revelation 11:18. 18. In Revelation 11:18, okay? And we see here that that reads, and the nations were angry. You know, and you can see in the world, you can see in the news today how the nations are angry. There's no peace in the world at all. But the nations were angry, and it says your wrath, but it's actually your judgment. Yahweh's judgment has come, and that the time of the dead, that they should be sentenced, and that you should give your reward to your servants, the prophets, and to all the saints, to those who reverence your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Now, that, that's saints. Now, notice there the side note there, out of the book of Yahweh, it's side note H, and it shows here that the word saints means my sanctified ones. My sanctified ones, and it means those who fulfill the whole law. It's those who fulfill the whole law. And you can see that comes from the Hebrew Aramaic, Aramaic English Dictionary by Marcus Jasper, volume 2, page 1319. So this is one scripture that's going to be, that's going to be reiterated throughout this, uh, throughout this chapter. And of course, the other one that is going to be at the same time, that is also going to be read multiple times and gone throughout, is... As here in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And of course, this is dealing with the seven-year peace plan, and it shows that, and that he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, and that one week is seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and instead will cause the prevalence of the Lord of heaven, even until the destruction that is determined will be poured out upon the desolator. So keep an eye out, just be on, just be on the lookout for these scriptures, and we're going to be referring to these um, you know, several times throughout the, throughout the course of this study. Um, vocabulary words. We've got two vocabulary words that we're going to be dealing with here. This first one here is the word Gentiles. And the word Gentiles, it means nations. And Pastor has even gone to show that it, means the, it, it even means the United Nations. And that second one there is blasphemies. You know, blasphemies is teaching that, the, that, that Yahweh is a vengeful God. And this is something that's very active in the churches today. This is a part of the deception that they push forth. This is how they, they get people to turn against Yahweh, how they get him to turn against the laws of Yahweh, and how they're trying to get the people to turn to Mother Mary by saying that Yahweh is nothing but a vengeful God. And we know that's not the case because Yahweh is a loving Heavenly Father. That's how he's described throughout the scriptures. Okay, but going back to nations, I want to show just a couple of things here about the United Nations. Anybody know much about the United Nations or have you looked into that at all? 
This is just going to be just kind of a real brief, just kind of a, a, a very, very brief overview. Okay, and it shows here, and this is from Wikipedia, but it shows that the earliest concrete plan for a new world organization began under the U.S. State Department in 1939. Now, notice when that began. It began in 1939, you know, just five years after the birth of the last day's witness. The text of the Declaration by the United Nations was drafted at the White House on, on 1229-41, and it was done by, by President Franklin Roosevelt there. And you can see Prime Minister Winston Churchill was involved, and Roosevelt aide Harry Hopkins was also involved. And uh, the ter there's a term in there. It says it incorporated Soviet suggestions but left no role for France. But notice the term there that's in quotes there. Four policemen. You see that? The term four policemen was coined to refer to the four major allied countries. Now, remember, we're talking about one of the things that we're covering in this, in the actions that deal with this, uh, with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, um, with the seven year peace plan involves the quartet, right? Well, notice here, you had the four policemen, these allied countries, and you see it involved the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and the Republic of China. You've got, notice here, you've got, you've got three out of the four of those who are involved in the current quartet, which I thought that was kind of interesting, but that, look, there's nothing new under the sun. The idea of the rule of four or the quartet is not new. It was even done in ancient Rome. That's how ancient Rome was ruled, was a rule of four. So that there's, a, there's a theme that goes along with that. But... There are 195 countries in the world today, okay? There's a total of 195 countries in the world today. Taiwan might be thrown in there as, as one, plus or minus one. Uh, it just, it, it just uh, it depends on how it's looked at, I suppose. But there's 195 countries in the world today, and there's 193 of these countries that are members of the United Nations, okay? And there are two countries that are non-members, observer states, which is the Holy See, which is the, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, and then you have the state of Palestine. Okay? And at its founding, the UN had 51 member states, and it was actually met, they met for a conference in 424, drafting the UN Charter in 424 of 1945, and it was adopted and signed on 626 of 1945. And then it actually took effect. The UN Charter took effect 1024 of 1945 when the, US, when the UN operations began. And it was established, the United Nations was established after World War II with the aim of preventing future wars. And, it, and it's notice here the way they described it is that it succeeded the ineffective League of Nations, which was which was in place from, from uh, 1919 to 1939, which was actually set out to try to do the same thing. But notice they say that the, that, the, that the League of Nations was ineffective. Well, we know from the world events, we know from the news today that the United Nations is absolutely 100% successful in their tasks of maintaining international peace and security. Because there's no wars, right? So they're successful. No. But this is what they're tasked with. They're tasked with maintaining international peace and security, with developing friendly relations among nations, and achieving international cooperation and, be, and being a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. And then, well, of course, there we see that their headquarters, their headquarters are in Manhattan, New York. That's where their main headquarters are, is. But they also have offices in Geneva. They have them in Nairobi, in Vienna, in The Hague. And if I remember correctly, is the International Criminal Court, I think, is, I think they're headquartered out of The Hague, if I remember right. But anyway, that's the United Nations. That's a little bit of history there on the United Nations. And getting into the introduction here, getting into, um, kind of getting into the introduction here, Pastor says, you can be seated. And he, you know, and he, he makes the comment here, he says, it's all coming to an end now. And so you will see this, it was back in, back in, in 2003, you know, pastor saw these things coming. But it's all coming to an end now, and we're getting to the end, as Elder Yadidia was showing you there. 
And then he brings about, the, about, about water. Water being low was a serious matter. Now, remember we had an issue with, uh, with, with, you know, we've had an issue on and on with drought, and it was brought out that we really need to be careful with our water usage. Okay? We need to be careful with the resources that Yahweh has given us, not to waste the things that Yahweh has given us. You know, and it, it's, it, water being low is a serious matter. If you remember, I think it was about a year and a half to two years ago, Cape Town, South Africa was on the verge of completely being without water. They were within a week and a half to two weeks of having absolutely no water. Okay, so being without water is a very serious thing, and we need to be conscientious of that. Okay, and I don't know what Yahweh is trying to keep off of us here, but if you notice, the winds are extremely strong from the south, and when I saw this, I knew something was taking place to protect this area, along with this lack of rain. Okay, we've got to remember that Yahweh is in complete control of everything that is going on around us. Yahweh is going to protect this work. Yahweh is going to protect the workers. He is going to protect, and this plan is going to go through. And everything that we're going through, you know, Yahweh is, Yahweh is in complete control. So, and he is protecting us from something, even though we may not see it. We may not realize it. We may realize it down the road later, as, is, as, it, as it is 99.9% .9 of the time. We don't realize what it is we've been, been protected from until way after the fact. And I don't know how many of people are here of, of you are as old as I am. I don't see very many of you here. He says, "Remember when I was in a, I was a child?" He says, "We bathed in a number four in a number four wash tub." And he says, "That's a pretty small tub." You know, I was trying to find information on a number four wash tub. I googled it. I did everything I could. And you know, I couldn't find a darn thing on it. I found one thing, and the only thing I found is a picture here. And this picture is kind of kind of fuzzy, but. Pastor, you know, he, he shows here that it was small. You can't get in it. You can't lie down. And you can see the image there of, of that individual washing clothes in that round tub. Well, this is, what, this is what the clothes were done in. This is how people bathed. You can see there isn't a whole lot of water that you can put in there. And you've got to remember, how was the water drawn? How, did the, how, did, how was the water gotten? It was gotten by hand, Right? You had to go out to the well, you had to get it out, you had to pump it out. And so and it, took a, it was a lot of work, and so you were going to be careful, very careful, and you were going to conserve what you had because you didn't want to have to go out and keep filling that up and filling that up. You're not going to fill it up, go out and pour out, pour out the water out of the tub and just go do it and you know, keep doing that over and over and over and over. Okay? And this is how we've been kind of spoiled in, 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 in these days here is because we can reach over and turn on a faucet. Well, we, have, we forget where it comes from. So, you know, we just have to keep that in mind, you know. And this is what Pastor's telling us here. You know, keep in mind where these things are coming from. You know, it's not a, you know, we have to keep, in, keep these things in mind. Uh, um, you know, and he talks about bathing in cold water, you know, about not having hot water. Um, you know, so he talks a lot, you know, he talks about that line, uh, on those things here. But... Down in verse 5, down in verse 5, he says, let's go back to the learning process. He says, let's go back to the learning process. You can understand this, as Elder Edidia showed, the prophecies are falling into place right now. And you've got to think about this whole learning process. What are we, what are we taught to focus on? What, what's, what's something that we're taught? What are, we, what are we taught? What should be our priority in seeking after? Praise Yahweh. Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh, right? So Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 4, verse 4 through 7, kind of gives us a little bit on this, on this, um, uh, this learning process. If you will seek after wisdom as you would for silver and search after her as you would for a hidden treasure, then you will understand the reverence of Yahweh and you will find the knowledge of our heavenly Father. For it is Yahweh who gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Notice, Yahweh reserves sound understanding for the righteous, and he is a shield of protection for those who walk uprightly. And, that's, and, and, and that is where our protection comes. Our protection, men, comes from obedience. Obedience to the law of Yahweh. Luke 20, uh, 12, 31 says, Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh, and all of these things will be added to you. 
Look at verse 32. He says, verse 32, he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's righteous pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, it's, the, it's this obedience. If there, if, there, if there be great tribulation upon the earth, it comes, not by, it comes not by the keeping of Yahweh's word, but through the wickedness of man. Remember, Proverbs tells us a curse causeless will not come. And we're being warned. And this is, this is what Pastor was getting here in this section, is getting rid of sin, getting sin out of our lives, getting this foolishness right out of our lives. And it's the obedience comes first, and then comes understanding. We may not understand a law or a command that we're given to do, but just because we don't understand it, that doesn't give us the right to rebel against it. Nothing gives us the right to rebel against any of Yahweh's laws. It's the, it's the obedience that comes first, and then, and then the understanding will come. Now, a few prophecies. Now, Elder Yudidia showed some of these prophecies. A couple of the prophecies that come about, that have come about, and that we, a lot of us here, can be witness to. The first one, the first prophecy, and you might, well, you might want to keep this, keep an eye out for this, okay? Kind of highlight this. This is something important. You might see it again. Okay? A few of the prophecies that have been fulfilled uh, before, you know, before and during this time. First one here, the reestablishment of the house of Yahweh in 2, 4 of 83. And of course, we see that there. That's in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and Micaiah chapter 4 and verse 1. And it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the promotion of the house of Yahweh will be established, or as one great Kahan puts it, it has been established and the chief of the nations, and it will be raised above all congregations. It is being raised above all congregations. Slowly but surely, it is being done. And all nations will eventually flow to it. Now, that's the same in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, and Micaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Okay, who has Zechariah chapter 5, verse 11? Who's got that one? And he said to me, to build the house of Yahweh according to the standard of protection sent by Yahweh's laws in a Babylonish land which does not yet exist, and it will be established at that time when the two witnesses are called out to their work as the established place, the habitation of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. So you can see there that Zechariah chapter 5, verse 11, shows that the two witnesses are going to build the house of Yahweh according to the standard of perfection. And that standard of perfection is according to the law of Yahweh, right? And it tells you where? In a Babylonian land that did not yet exist. And we'll get into that toward the end of class today. Okay? And it will be established at that time. And, and, and you can see specific time periods here when the two witnesses are called out to do their work as the established place. So you can see here that they're going to reestablish the house of Yahweh. Now, there's another thing that took place. There's another thing that took place that we can see here. And we can see here it has to do with the birth of the witness, Yisrael Hawkins. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 through 2, you know, we see a lot in here about that. You can see that here, yet here now, Yaakov, my servant, and Yisrael, whom I have chosen. This is what Yahweh said, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not be afraid, Yaakov, my servant, and Yeshram, beloved Yisrael, whom I have appointed. So there's a lot in there that you can, there's a lot that's covered in that scripture in and of itself. Uh, but this is one scripture that does, uh, that does show that the, show the birth of the two witnesses. And then you also have Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 1, which shows, Listen, O isles and countries, listen to me. Listen, you peoples from afar. Yahweh has called me from the womb. From the bowels of a mother, he has made mention of my name. And that should bring back, back the scriptures and the sermons that have been given on how the witness Yisrael was given his name. On how he was given his name. Remember, he was named by his one-year-old brother. Okay, and again, you know, there's, there's scriptures that, uh, you know, there's sermons that go into a lot of detail concerning, concerning that. We also have another prophecy that has come to pass 
uh, came to pass, and this is one of the scriptures that we're looking at. This is the scripture that is that we're going to be reinforcing throughout this study here is Daniel 9.27. And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, the signing of that seven-year peace plan. And we're going to get into a little bit more of the details on that here in just a few minutes. But these are just some of the, these are, again, just some of the scriptures that we can look at to show, you know, to show uh, the, the prophecies that have been fulfilled in these last days. And why is pastor going over these? Why is he showing these things? He's showing these things so that we can trust him, so that, so that we can put our faith and trust in him. Proving to us, yes, I prophesied of these things in the past. So you can trust me. You can trust in what I'm telling you. You can trust in what I'm telling you for the future. Okay? Another thing, another thing we saw that took place, uh, anybody remember the event that took place uh, the seventh Roman month, uh, 16th day of the seventh Roman month back in 1994? What was that that took place back then? Praise Yahweh, war in heaven. So that's the other one. That's another prophecy that we can see that had come to pass. And we see that was described there in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And we see that war in heaven where Micaiah and her Malachim fought against the dragon and the dragon fought with her angels, but they did not prevail, nor was their found, place found in heaven anymore. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. She was cast out into the earth and her angels were cast out with her. You know, unveiling Satan. Uh, you know, that book, you know, covers, you know, covers that. Uh, the, um, and I just lost, I just lost my train of thought on the other, on, on the other, the, uh, um, the birth of the nuclear baby, the explosion of sin that covered that war in heaven as well. You know, um, and then in verse 10 there you can see, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Father and the power of his Messiah for the accuser of our, of our brothers is cast down who accused them before our Father day and night. And then you can see in Yekeska chapter 28. Now you, you, remember, Yekeska 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, they both have, you know, the whole chapter is about you know, is about Satan and how Satan elevated herself and lifted her up into the position of the gods and, and what that actually is going to get for her. And you see here in verse 17, Yekeski uh, 28, 17 shows there, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty and you have corrupted your wisdom uh, because of your splendor and I will cast you to the ground and I will lay you before kings so that they may behold you. Isaiah chapter 14 shows the same thing. It says, how have you fallen from heaven? O Hillel, Lucifer, Aphrodite, Venus, child of the light, how you are cut to the ground, you who weaken the nations. So, you know, we can see these scriptures here, you know, you know show these prophecies uh, of, of what has taken place here in, 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 in very recent, you know, very, uh, very, very recent time period. And Pastor Sows here, he continues there and he says, he says, we delayed bringing up this stuff because I wanted the camp to be free of sin this Passover. Okay? He wanted the sin, he wants the camp to be free of sin. And it was, it was not just that Passover, but this is what everyone, this is what we are striving to do. We are striving to get sin completely out of our lives. And I believe that he says, he will, we will probably receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit come Pentecost if you remain true. If you remain true. Now to remain true... That true means steadfast and loyal. If you remain true to what? If you remain true to overcoming. If you made steadfast to overcoming. If you remain loyal to overcoming. If you remain honest, just, and truthful. You know, we have to be honest with ourselves and, and examine ourselves with repentance so that we can truly overcome so that we can truly put sin out of our lives and this is what he's trying to get across to us here and it also means without deviation not turning to the right of what we're told not turning to the left but I think it's either as Proverbs says or Psalm says but to walk only on established paths and that means what's written here in Deuteronomy 17 verses 10 through 11 says, you must act according to the sentence they pronounce to you, that is the priest, 
for at the place Yahweh chooses, be careful to do all that they order you to do. According to the law that they teach you, you shall do. And according to the decisions that they give you, you shall do. You must not turn to the right hand nor to the left from the sentence they pronounce for you. So, because our counselors, our counselors are there here to help us get rid of sin. They're, help, they're here to help us guide us into the kingdom. That's what our counselors are here for. You know, and that's what they do. You know, and pastors tells us here, he says, you know, we are overcoming. And, and you know, with this, now I've got to show this. I have to show this one too here in Acts. Because this is really important here. Because this is important because this goes right along with what pastor is saying about we have to, about wanting to get sin out of the camp here. Because, because look at, at how, the, how the apostles, look at what took place on this day, in, on this day of Pentecost here. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were of one accord. They were, there weren't divisions. There wasn't striving. They were of one accord. They were united in mind. They had their minds focused on one thing. And they had their minds focused on overcoming. They had their minds focused on getting sin out of their lives. And they were in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven just as a violent wind being carried and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they perceived that languages were being distributed just as lightning instantly settling, instantly settling on each, on each one of them. So they perceived that the languages were being distributed. And the side note, the side note of that was where, uh, where it talks about they perceived that languages were being distributed. That means that they gave the, he gave them greater understanding of his word, that is the law and the prophets. Okay, you realize how that came about? It was because they were united in mind. They were, they, they were of one accord. They were united. They, you know, they were given, it, quite, it, it looks like they were given a portion of, of that subconscious mind to be able to unlock that understanding. They were given that understanding. Just as lightning instantly settles on each one of them. You know, we remember in the, in the book, um, there is someone out there. You know, you can remember it takes only a, it takes just the unlocking of a single cell in order to release, the, in, order, in order to give access to the subconscious mind. And that, is, that was displayed through the various savants and things along that line through accidents. And that was just kind of a glimpse of what the subconscious mind is capable of. Well, if we are in, 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 of, of one accord and united in mind and getting rid of sin, as pastors explaining to us here, this is what we need to get out. You know, this is, you know, this is what we have to do. This is what is necessary for us to... to to be able to enter into that kingdom, to be able to get these gifts. Because if we're striving to overcome and we're putting the righteousness into our minds, this is what we're going to be able to draw upon. The things that are beneficial. He says we're overcoming. He says, I see, he says we're, we are overcoming. Um, who's got Genesis chapter 4 verse 7? If you do righteousness, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do righteousness, sin is crouching at your door. The desire of sin is with you, but you must overcome it. Okay. Praise Yahweh. You see that desire, that desire to sin. The desire to sin is with you. That's what the carnal mind does. You know, that desire to sin is with you. Now, look at the word, that word desire. It means a conscious impulse towards something that promises enjoyment and satisfaction in its attainment. It can mean a longing. It can mean a craving. Remember, Satan exploited that in her deception. She exploits that in deception today to make everything out in the world, this adultery and this fornication, as we're going to get into here in just a minute, and makes it look so joyful, so beneficial. She exploits that and tries to get people to act impulsively, playing on the, you know, that conscious impulse, get, try, playing on that unrighteous desire. So that is what we have to make sure that we get a grip on. We have to make sure that we control it. Use that STOP acronym as we're taught in the Peaceful Solution. Who's got Revelation chapter 3, verse 12? 
He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the house of the eye of my father, and he will never go out of it. And I will write upon him the name of my father, and the name of the new Jerusalem which comes down out of the heavens from my father, newly named. Praise you, Alex. So, he who overcomes, overcomes what? Overcomes this desire to sin. And how do we overcome that desire to sin? How do we do that? Jacob chapter 4 verse 7 shows us how, shows us how we do that. Uh, Jacob chapter 4 verse 7 tells us if we submit to Yahweh, tells us to submit to Yahweh, resist the devil and she will flee. It's, that, it, it, it's really that simple. It's obedience. It's that obedience to, 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 the, to the laws of Yahweh. It's being obedient to the one that has been placed over us. Now, pastor says here, he says, I see men and women who are, who, have, who are really turning to holiness. I see women who are actually being holy and true to their husbands, that is submitting to their heads, actually holy to them and to Yahweh. Uh, you know, and men, this doesn't just apply to the women, okay? Submitting to their heads. Remember, we are all striving to be the bride of Yahshua. We are all falling into this, so we also have to be holy and true to the authority that has been placed over us. And see, Pastor, again, you know, he's showing us how to enter into this kingdom. You know, uh, look at positive law uh, number, who's got positive law number 211? Leviticus 9, 2, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, Yahweh, your heavenly Father, am holy. Praise Yahweh, yes. It is a law. It is a law for us to become holy just as Yahweh himself is holy. Okay? And this is what pastors see. This is what, he's, this is what he sees. He, he sees people actually, he, he sees it in confessions. You know, he sees it in everyday interactions. You know, he sees, he sees, us, he sees us overcoming. Um, who's got positive law number 73? Positive law number 73, we must confess our sins to Yahweh and repent for them and be converted to the keeping of Yahweh's laws, Numbers 5, 6, and 7. Praise Yahweh. So we see here that, you know, this confession, the ability to actually confess, to confess our sins and to, and to repent of them, you know, actually puts us back in contact with Yahweh, which is what we're striving to do here. We're striving. Remember the, name, the title of this book. Making the connection with Yahweh. This is what we're striving to do. You know, and we're being given the tools to be able to do that. And Pastor shows here, he says, at this time, he said, there's very little sin left in the camp, and he wants to get it all out. You know, that's the, that's the desire, is to get it completely out. Then he shows here, he says, I didn't want to deal with the fallaways this feast. He says, I know that we're going to be dealing with them soon. I don't blame them for wanting to come back. They shouldn't have left. They should have learned to love the law and stayed for that reason as you have, you know, as we have. You know, we, you know, you know, we are staying here because, uh, as, as Psalm shows, Psalm 119 shows that. Oh, how we love your law, how we love your law. It is our meditation all the day. Your laws make us wiser than our enemies because they are our possession at all times. How sweet are your laws to our taste, sweeter than the honey to our mouths. Great peace, notice verse 165, great peace have they who love your law, and nothing will offend them, nothing will cause them to fall away because of unbelief or sin. And this is why, men, we need to be here. We need to be here because of the love of the law, because the laws bring no harm to anyone. And pastor shows right now, he says, right now it would take a damn fool, as far as I'm concerned, to go out and commit adultery or fornication knowing what we know is out there, and knowing what it's causing. You know, this is, you know, Pastor, he hit this, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but Pastor hit this hard yesterday, didn't he? He hit it hard because of all of the prophecies, of everything that we've seen coming to pass, of everything we know that is out there, man, you know, it's, it, like he says, it would take a fool to go out there and to get involved in that again. Look at 2 Kepha 2.20, and it says, Now after they have escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge of Yahweh, and we have, we've escaped 
through this knowledge, we're learning how to cleanse ourselves. We're learning how to protect ourselves from falling in these things any, anymore. But if they are again, again entangled in them and overcome by them, the latter end is worse than the beginning. You know, it's a very disgusting thing. It's, uh, it's one of the other scriptures puts it as a dog returning to his own vomit. Okay, and that's a pretty disgusting image in your mind, right? But that's how it looks when, when, when people come to this knowledge, they come here, and then they, they forsake it and they leave. Let me see here. Um, You know, and one of the one of the pulls, man, one of the pulls that is really is is really out there in the world is is the, these sexual pulls that are out there. It's the it's the it's the it's the pushing forth of the illegal lust. You know, and um, who's got prohibitive law number three fifty three? Prohibitive law three fifty three. A man must have sexual must not have sexual relationships with a woman. Until he has lawfully, or until he has lawfully acquired her in marriage. Okay, praise Yahweh. So, relations with any with a woman is not lawful until they are acquired, lawfully acquired in marriage. Until marriage takes place. Okay, there is no such thing as going out and finding somebody committing fornication with them and say, oh, now we're married. Fornication does not make marriage. Okay? Fornication does not make a marriage. Fornication is fornication. Plain and simple. That's what it is. It is a sin. Plain and simple. Okay? Don't let anybody try to, try to convince you otherwise. It has to be done. It has to be done Yahweh's way. But you know it, it, it has it, it has to be done that it has to be done this way, and even in Exodus in Exodus it, it shows there that if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed to be married and sleeps with her, he must surely pay the bride price for her. But notice that in verse seventeen there is Exodus twenty two verse seventeen: If her father utterly refuses to give him to her, he shall still pay the bride's price. Okay, there is no automatic marriage in that way. All right. Okay, but this is again, you know, again, this is a way. This is one. This is a huge pull. This is a huge pull that is that is out there. It's it's out there in advertising. It's out in everything that we see. And pastor, you might want to mark this down here. You might want to pay particular attention to the stuff that's written here in verse seven. It says, if you haven't listened to those X-rated tapes, you need to listen to them. It says they're not just filthy talk. They're a way to get you to understand why you should not break Yahweh's law. You know, this pastor was explaining some of this yesterday. The diseases that are out there. What is out? You know, what is out there? Just going to the, just going to the store. But there are ways to get you to understand why you should not break Yahweh's law. They explain why you can't live forever breaking the law of Yahweh. You can't. There is no way we can expect to break the law of Yahweh and live forever. Who's got Romans six twenty three? Romans 6, 23, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Yahweh is eternal life through Yeshua Messiah, our Savior. Praise Yahweh. So the wages of sin, what we get with sin, sin doesn't bring life. There's no way you can mix in sin and righteousness and have life, any form of life. It's not there. Who's got 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six? The sting of sin is death. The power over sin is the law. Praise Yahweh. So again, you can see here that, that if we choose to do these things, if we, if, if we, if we choose to, to participate in sin, then we have curses that are going to come upon us. And of course, we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, another one kind of for your notes here. I don't think I have that one. I didn't print that one out for some reason. But Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 19, you might want to write this down, uh, just for your notes, just so you can reference it. But it says, See, I have set before you this day life by righteousness and death and destruction. 
And that I command you this day to love Yahweh your Father by walking in all his ways, by keeping all of his laws, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And so Yahweh your Father may bless you in the land which you go in to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and you're drawn away to submit to gods, to worship them by serving them, then I declare to this day that you will surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the yard and to possess. I call heaven and earth as witness against you this day because I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Because your free agents, notice your free agents, to make your own choice between righteousness and evil. Therefore, choose life. Choose life so that both you and your children may live. And this is what Pastor was emphasizing yesterday. You know, you know, don't don't get don't get caught up in this stuff in the in the ways of this world. The ways of the world bring nothing but death and destruction. The only way to life is right here. Okay? No other way. And now we start talking about you're going to see about war that war in Iraq is a very scary thing. You know, any war, anywhere, it doesn't matter where you are. War is a scary thing. We're protected here in the United States to a certain degree. We don't see war. We haven't been really exposed to it like they are in Iraq or Iran. You know, but it doesn't mean much right now, and it means Israel is going to be extended. And I'm going to show you that in prophecy. Remember this part here. You're going to see Israel expanded over to the great river Euphrates. You're going to see the, uh, Israel expanded over to the great river Euphrates. That's why Syria is going to be next. Look at what Pastor was telling us was going to take place. And this prophecy, there's a prophecy that shows this. Who's got Isaiah 17.1? Isaiah 17.1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Praise Yahweh. So Damascus, Damascus will cease from being a city. Have we seen that? Have we seen that in the news? Has that prophecy come to pass? Is it coming to pass? Praise Yahweh. Pastor was telling us about that years ago. And it was prophesied of years ago. And it will, it will cease from being a city. And then in Zechariah 9.1, there it shows there, it says, remember, and upon Damascus, you know, these prophecies, you know, everything rests with Damascus. Now, Pastor talked about that here not long ago. But we see here the scripture describes the boundary line or the line that says they're bound in that great river. Okay, remember that. They're bound in that great river. Talking about the great river Euphrates. Now they're not tied up and they're not thrown in the great river Euphrates. You know, but this is a boundary line for them. It's a boundary line for them in prophecy where the lands are going to be expanded. You know, um, and we see that in, in Revelation 9.14 where it says, the, the, the sixth Moloch with the trumpet says, loose the four angels who are bound for the great river Euphrates. Okay? Okay, but they're not tied up, but this is where it's going to be, you know, it's going to be extended. Genesis tells us that. Uh, it, it shows that the, to the descendants of Abraham, uh, Genesis 15, 18, says to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Micaiah the prophet Micaiah, he talks about it also. He talks about the day will come, uh, come to you from uh, Syria to the fortified cities of Egypt, from Egypt to the river Euphrates, from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain. In the day, and he says that in the day that your walls will, are to be rebuilt, that day your boundary will be far extended. So again, you know, we can see the time period here in the day that your walls are to be rebuilt. Okay, and then... Um, Prime Minister Sharon is probably the one who knows this. He won't tell others because of the fact that it would bring more hatred from the nations. Remember, Revelation 8, 11, 18 says that the nations were angry. And the United States is already hated enough as it is, according to prophecy too. And this is the only thing it shows. It's not the end. It's not what we're looking for in the end. What we're looking for is the signing of that seven-year peace treaty back into operation again. What did we just see take place at Pentecost. Didn't we see this? Praise Yahweh. Now, if you remember, the seven-year peace plan, it stayed in operation for three and a half years, and it was signed 9-13-93. Please pay attention to what I'm saying here, and this is highlighted. Okay, this is something to be highlighted. The seven-year peace treaty was signed 9-13-93, and it went into effect when? 
10, 13, 93. And he says, if you want, if you want to write that down, I'm going to give you some more figures. We'll highlight it because we're going to be seeing it again. Okay. It says the seven year treaty stayed in operation for three and a half years. Then prime minister Netanyahu stopped it. And he said that it was detrimental to Israel. He said that that peace treaty was detrimental to Israel. Remember pastor brought that out here recently? It was a very recent sermon. I say very recent sermon that he brought that out. Um, well, it was. It was about seven months ago. Eight, no, nine, ten. About ten months ago. 12-15 of 2018. And it's actually in the 18th book of Yisrael. Tested and proven. Chapter 37, verse 44. Pastor explained that sacrifice. He said, it's sacrifice. Get this. It means destruction, surrender of something for the sake of something else. This is exactly what the seven-year plan, peace plan was doing to Israel. Netanyahu said it was detrimental to Israel. He said, we need to take all of this ourselves. It's detrimental to Israel, and he shut it down. It means something given up. Okay, and that's what the word, that's what that word sacrifice to me, that, that word sacrifice means. But the thing to remember about this, about the seven-year peace plan, as Pastor showed us, and he's told us for years from the very beginning, that it's a plan of action. It's a seven-year plan of action. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's seven years consecutive one after another. In other words, year one starts here, and year seven ends here, seven years in between, and it's done. You know? Uh, it, but it's a year of uh, it's seven years of action. That was the first thing he says he brought out about it. He says it was seven year plan of action. Different events having to take place over a period of time. It wasn't necessarily seven consecutive years. In other words, one after the other. And Yahweh showed that it wasn't. And Yahweh showed that it wasn't seven years. I will use these words on public television, so they know that I said it. I said, once this plan is signed back into action, the clock will start ticking and bring us this last three and a half years, which is known by all of the prophets and all of the apostles as what? The end. Okay? As the end. But Daniel 8.17 says, So he came near where I stood, and when, I, when he approached, I was frightened. And I fell down upon my face, and he said to me, Understand, O son of man, for the fulfillment of the vision belongs to the two events that will take place in the time of the end. Okay? In the time of the end. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, very familiar scripture to all of us. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book to the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. And so we see the time period identifying the end here is a time period when knowledge would be increased. And we know that that time period began in the, time, in, the, in the year 1934. And it says, And I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two others, one on this side of the bank of the river, and one on the other. There. There it is. And one on the other side of the bank of the river. And, on, uh, and, and said to the man clothed in linen, on that, who on that future day is teaching, how long will it be to the end of these wonders? Okay? And then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was on that future day teaching, with his right hand and his left hand held toward, toward heaven and vowed by him who lives forever. It will be for a times, times and a half, when Yahweh will have accomplished pouring out his power through his holy people, and all of these things will be finished. Then we see here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, how and I will give power or give to my two witnesses to perform the prophetic offices, and they will foretell events about the three and one half years those cast about with darkness, and those all talk about that time period. So they identify how long this this end time period will be. It's a time period of three and a half years. It's not a day. It's a three and a half year period that will bring an end to man's government. Highlight that. Highlight that sentence there. It's not a day. It's not a day. It's three and a half year time period that will bring an end to man's government of and by the people. Okay? It's going to bring an end to that. In Daniel 2.44.
And in the days of these kings, Yahweh in heaven will appoint a kingdom of priests which will never be destroyed. This is what's being formed now, men. This is what is being formed now. A kingdom of priests which will never be destroyed, nor will the kingdom be left to another people. But it will break into pieces and consume all of these kingdoms and it will stand forever. This kingdom that is being established now is going to stand forever. Okay? And then Daniel 7, 26 through 27, but the judgment will sit and they will take away his government and consume and destroy it completely. Then the kingdoms and the governments and the greatness of the kingdoms under, under the whole heaven will be given notice to the people of the saints of Yahweh. Remember what the saints are? Who the saints are? Okay. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all governments will serve and obey him. So this is this kingdom. This is what is being established. All right. Okay, we're here now in verse, uh, verse 15 here. Revelation 11.1. 1. This is our work, Pastor shows here. This is our work. It also shows the last 42 moons of man's government. Now, everything has come to pass up to this time. And this is why we looked at those. Well, this is why we looked back over here in the very beginning, over here on, on uh, around verse 5, or, you know, verse 5 around there, about the different prophecies and stuff that were fulfilled. Okay? Because this is the things, these are things that we can see that have come to pass in our lifetimes that we have personally witnessed to see these things come to pass. Okay? There was a seven year plan. It stayed in operation for three and a half years as the prophet said it would. It was shut down and has been shut down for approximately seven years. At that time, that's what it was. And they're getting ready to put it back into operation again. They're getting ready to put that plan, they're getting ready to put that plan back into operation again. Okay? And then we see here, uh, we see here, uh, um, let me see, we see this quartet. We see the four angels. We see the four messengers are putting it back. They're putting it back into operation, okay? These four messengers, this quartet, this Middle East quartet, remember, this is part of what we're going over in this, in this sermon. I probably didn't have to put that up there, but I'll go ahead and I'll put it up there anyway. The Middle East Quartet, so we can see who is involved with that. We see it's the United States, the United Nations, the European Union, and Russia. They're all involved. This is all mark, make up this quartet, okay? All right. Now, this quartet, you know, we know the quartet, they're not going to bring peace. They're not going to bring peace. Revelation 9, 13 through, uh, 13 through 15 shows us, shows us that the sixth Moloch, the sixth Moloch sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Yahweh, saying to the sixth Moloch, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels who are bound for the great river Euphrates. And they were, they were loosed, which were prepared for an hour a day and a moon and a year in order to slay a third part of men. And this is what we see. This is what we're waiting on. This is what we're waiting to see uh, start taking place here. Daniel 8, 22. Did I get that one? Okay. When we're not the only ones who know this, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, pastor shows, he shows here, he says, the Catholic Church knows this. Malachi Martin wrote about it years ago when this first started taking place. And I quoted Malachi Martin's work, The Keys of This Blood, and also his interviews where he showed that Mother Mary, the Queen of Heaven, was going to wage war, wage war against these nations. He said, Mother Mary is going to win. You know, he, he, you know, he put that out there. And he said, Mother Mary is going to win. And this is what he said in his interviews. And he revealed the plans of the Catholic Church. And I don't think you'll have any doubt that the Catholic Church is in this war and what is going on and, on, and, 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 and what is involved in going on in Israel fully. When you see all of the evidence that I have to bring out during this time period here, 
you know, it's, you know, it's going to be evident. And we, we know that we've seen in our studies just how deeply the tentacles of the Catholic Church reach into all aspects of life. Okay? But, and you know, they're pushing, you know, and they're pushing to have, you know, to have this, to have Mother Mary take over. And this is nothing new. They've done this since they've done this from the beginning of history. They've always done this. Uh, in Daniel seven twenty one to twenty three, we see here I beheld the same horn, made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of Yahweh, and that the time came that the saints possessed the kingdoms. And this is what he said: the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which will be different from all other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, and it will tread it down. And it will break it into pieces, and this is what the this is what the this is what that they have done. This is exactly what they have done. You know this. You know the, and the United States. The, the United States has been made image. The second beast is being made in the image of the first beast. And who is like you know who dare comes against you know who can make war against the beast? And you know that's actual a characteristic trait of the tribe of Yada. Genesis 49, pastor's been bringing this out recently also. Genesis 49, 8 through 9, yada. Your brothers will praise you and your hands will be on the neck of your enemies. They always have been. Your father's son will bow down to you. You're a lion's cub, O yada. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lion's breed. And who dares to rouse him? Who dares comes against this beast? Okay? So who dares, you know, who dares come against this beast? Now we see here, and just a few minutes that we have left here, we'll uh, read here in verse 17. And this gives us some information concerning the temple measurements, the road map, the quartet. In Revelation 11.1, 1, it shows that there was a, it was given to me a reed like a measuring rod. And that's me, you know, that's me, that's us, that's the house of Yahweh. The Moloch stood, that's me, the messenger. That's me, stood saying, rise and measure the temple. I actually said this. He said he actually said this to Elder Yaakov Moshe when he was working closely with me at that time on fulfilling prophecy. You know, it's a, it's a prophecy of a man who Yahweh called an Oki before the land of Oklahoma was ever invented. And I can show you that in the hidden codes. You know, he can show that in the hidden codes here. And I want to show you this here real quick. We got that entitled from the ends of the earth in Isaiah 41 verses 8 through 9. It says, but you, Yisrael, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen from the, uh, the seed of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and have called you from the furthest parts of it and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away from the ends of the earth. Yahweh knew that Oklahoma was going to be a state one day. He knew it was. He was going to have a messenger who was born there. And we see that in Isaiah 49 or 41 verse 9. And that messenger would be able to fly. And yes, he has flown all over everyone. There's pictures all around that show the different leaders and, and different dignitaries that he has met with. But we see here the, 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 uh, the, the nations, you know, I, that... Uh, that, that pastor has visited, but Oklahoma was going to be a state one day. Oklahoma was the 46th state to be admitted into the nations. Okay? Oklahoma was the 46th state, and that wasn't admitted into the United States until 11-16-1907. So very, very recently, as far as history is concerned, was the... Was the, um, the uh, Oklahoma actually admitted into into the uh, the United States. So I think, men, we're going to go ahead, and I think this is going to be a decent place for us to go ahead and stop, and we'll get into the, the uh, about rising and measuring the temple, and we'll continue there next week. So with that, I pray that Yahweh be with you, that Yahweh bless you.